Hello and welcome to Nothing But Dicta, the podcast where everyone has an opinion and you get to hear it. My name is Lex Kirkwood and I'll be your host today. On this episode, you'll hear my interview with GW Law's Dean Alan Morrison. Dean Morrison was my civil procedure professor one L year, and in addition to teaching, he currently serves as the Learner Family Associate Dean for Public Interest and Public Service Law. Dean Morrison has taught at some of the best law schools in the country, worked in a number of areas of law, many of which you'll hear about in a few minutes, and has argued and won cases in front of the Supreme Court. Most importantly, he is funny and insightful and full of wisdom for aspiring lawyers. I hope that you'll enjoy. So I'm here with Dean Morrison, and uh, we're going to get right into it. So Dean Morrison, I was lucky enough to take your civil procedure class last year, and I appreciated the emphasis you put on the power of a law degree and the potential to use it for good. Could you speak about some of the challenges, but also the benefits students preparing for a legal career in public interest may face? It's a pretty big question. It is. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, so let me start with, with why, the, with the benefits. Um, if you're a person who cares about what you're doing with your life, and whether you are trying to make the world a better place, you have a much better chance of being able to do that working for a public interest organization, no matter what the subject is, uh, than you will working for a large law firm. Uh, the large law firm does what it wants to do, what its clients want to do. Uh, the public interest organization at least has a chance of doing things that you want to do and that matter to you personally. The challenges, of course, are that there are not very many uh, organizations because they don't have the money to hire as many people as, as they'd like. Uh, the challenge also is that there are a significant number of lawyers who understand that this is important work and they would like to do it. Um, and uh, the organizations don't have much money and many students have very, very large debts and uh, I'm hoping to be able to do something about that here at GW, but it's a very hard, hard uh, problem to solve. Yeah, uh, can you speak to some of the uh, funding opportunities at GW? Well, uh, you know, there are scholar scholarships on the front end. Uh, my own view is that it would be, we would be better off, the world would be better off, and public interest lawyers would be better off if we focused more on the back end. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, lots of people talk good talks at the front end, I want to do this, I want to do that, and they give me the money and uh, so forth, or, or, or they just give the money based on, on merit aid uh, because of their GPAs and, and LSATs, and those are the people who end up with the highest grades and they go to work for the big law firms and they have smaller debt than the people who want to do public interest work will get much less pay. It seems to be a reverse Robin Hood problem. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's very hard to solve. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, my next question is um, for students interested in public interest after law school, um, other than, I suppose, coming into a large amount of money, uh, what are some suggestions you have for how they spend their time while they're still in law school? In order to be a good public interest lawyer, you have to be a good lawyer. And uh, the public interest lawyers have to know more than lawyers going to work at large firms. Uh, when I was a public citizen, we didn't have an antitrust department, we didn't have a constitutional law department, we didn't have an administrative law department. Everybody had to know everything. And you had to know more than that because you had to figure out if there was a problem and what we could do about it and you really had to understand the law. So that's my first advice. It uh, doesn't mean you shouldn't be taking some other courses that you're, that you're interested in, but you've got to be a good lawyer. You have to know the basics of the law. You have the constitutional law, administrative law, uh, and uh, other things as well. Uh, the second thing is uh, public interest firms are looking for people who have demonstrated commitment meaning how you spend your summers, what you did when you were in law school, and other activities. Um, some indication that, that you that why you want to come come there and that, that includes you know outside field placement uh, while you're here, so how you spend your summers, uh, something to do with the courses you, you've taken and things that you've done in the rest of your life. you know somebody who has been in the Peace Corps or taught and teach for America is more likely to be end up being a public interest lawyer than somebody who has worked for Goldman Sachs when I came to law school. Yeah, that's good to hear as someone who was in the Peace Corps before law school. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I always look for those. I, I know that they, they have a, I mean, I, I look for Peace Corps people for two reasons. One is when they come to law school, I know that they're serious. That They're not coming to law school because, my God, it's September. 
I, I've been in school every year in my life. Uh, it, I must go to some school now. No, you, you know what it is to be out and know what it is to make some sacrifices and, and to come to law school. So uh, that's why I look for Peace Corps people. Yeah, certainly. Although I will say the no internet for two years and then trying to figure out Zoom school was quite the challenge for uh, me. <laughs> yes. Well, some of us never figured it out. We started with it. <laughs> it's definitely not internet age. When I started practicing law, we, they barely had copying machines. Right. So, Right. As I tell my students, uh, when I went to law school, we had stone tablets instead of books. <laughs> um, all right. So when deciding a career, be that public interest or really any law career, which factors do you believe students should weigh highest when they're making determinations about you know, what they want their first job or what ultimate path they want to go on? I, I think that's very much an individual assessment. Mm -hmm. That is that there are no right or wrong answers. Uh, different people have different views about themselves and about how they want to spend their time. So let's just take within the world of public interest law. Uh, there are people who love doing direct service. They feel that that's what they are best at. They would not be happy if they didn't have regular contact with their clients. There are other people who, while recognizing the importance of client contact, are much more interested in law reform and they're, they think that way uh, rather than on a direct service basis. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer on that or what the mix should be between them. So that's just one, 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 one example of, of uh, what is. But, you know, uh, as I've said in other contexts, um, law school is a place you're intellectually challenged and you should hope to be able to have a career which finds intellectual challenge. Um, as I said earlier today, uh, being on the right side of questions and being able to do what you want to do in an area which you want to want to work is very very important to some people and not important to uh, other people uh, some people like a variety of kinds of, of work to do kind of tools to use other people are happy to do just one area of the law uh, so there aren't any right or wrong answers and uh, there's no reason why you should know how you're going to turn out while you're in law school after all you've not practiced law uh, you don't know what it's like to be in a public interest firm, or for that matter, even a, a large firm, although you may have some ideas about that for other reasons. But until you've done some area of the law, you really don't know what it's like. And getting a sense of it from the class is, at best, marginal. So uh, I always tell the students, uh, if you haven't figured out what you want to do, uh, you don't have to decide before supper tonight. <laughs> And, and, and that's comforting in a way, because one of the great things about the law is that you can do many different things with your law degree and, and many different areas. For example, uh, intellectual property, when I started practicing law, was very much a backwater area of the law. No large firm had intellectual property, it had patents, co copyright, trademark. Some little boutique firm, and boutique firms I meant five or ten lawyers, boutique firms, did that kind of work. Uh, and now, of course, no big firm would be without major departments. That's where the money is and also where the clients are. Um, and obviously things like the, the internet and cybersecurity, unknown uh, 20 years ago. And so we uh, lawyers are in a position to adapt and to find new ways of, of uh, using their law degrees. And so that's a good thing for lawyers. Yeah. Um, and you kind of touched on some of the changes you've seen in your law career. Um, and before this interview, you noted that there's a theme of serendipity. Could you elaborate on that and maybe give uh, listeners a background of like the sure. overview of your so, law career? Uh, well, <laughs> okay. So uh, when I finished law school, um, I had applied to come to Washington to work for a firm that was then known as Arnold Fortas, uh, Arnold Porter. Uh, Abe Fortas had recently gone on the Supreme Court and they were interested in having me come, but they were worried that because they had made some promises to, to the Supreme Court clerks, and they were worried that they wouldn't have enough business to hire, to hire one more lawyer. So we went back and forth and back and forth, um, and finally I said to them, look, you gotta tell me, are you gonna give me a job or not? And they said, well, one more week, and I said no. So I went to New York and worked at a, at a law firm there, Cleary Gottlieb. Um, Cleary Gottlieb was considered a large law firm at the time in New York. There were 50 lawyers and there were 55 lawyers in the, in the firm. <laughs> and uh, one of the serendipity, so 
not getting a job at Arnold Porter. I went to Cleary Gottlieb, but I was, I was very happy there. One of the things that happened there was one of the young associates uh, who had been there a, little, a year or so more than I, I had, uh, his wife had gone to Smith College and her first year roommate uh, uh, became my wife. So first jobs are very important and we're still married. <laughs> first jobs are very important, but not in ways that you can always figure out, okay. So the second thing happened was uh, serendipitous. Uh, I'll give you the shorter version of it. I, I, was, I decided to interview at the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York, and uh, I, uh, I was required to go to talk to people in the Civil Division. I had been, a summer, I'd been there in, as a summer uh, associate uh, one summer, and uh, I'd done work in the Criminal Division, and, and I, if I knew that the Civil Division was there, it was simply in the back of my mind. But I, I had no particular interest in it, but they said to me, you go talk to the uh, Civil Division. I talked to the guy who was the head of the Civil Division. And um, he said to me, you know, um, I have this big case against U.S. Steel. It's a tax case from the Korean War, excess profits tax. And he said, I need somebody to come and work with me on this case. It's going to go to trial in a year. And so I said to myself, would, he, he offered me the job. And I said, this looks like an opportunity that I would never have and just happened to, to, to fall into it. And, and sure enough, I was there. For, uh, I took the job. I went to work for him. A year later, he left. And two years out, two and a half years out of law school, I was in charge of this $250 million tax case that went to trial. Uh, just fell into it, the whole thing. Oh, I got promoted to be the assistant chief of the civil division. And um, I had a student working for me once summer. I guess I'd been, out, I'd been there about three years at the time. And at the time, very few people in the U.S. Attorney's Office had stayed for, for more than three or four years. Uh, the pay was bad. Uh, not terrible bad, but bad. And um, I had been thinking about what I was going to do, and I realized that I didn't want to go to uh, back to a big firm. I'd had much too much responsibility. And I didn't want to go to a regular old small commercial firm that was simply moving money around between people. There was nothing wrong with it, just that wasn't what I wanted to do. And I had seen a lot of cases in which lawyers had not done a very good job for clients and cases against the government. And I thought that I could do a better job and against the government, against big companies sometimes they're the same. And so I decided I was going to be a public interest lawyer. And so when the student asked me what I was going to do, we were having lunch, and, and I, I told him that I was thinking about being a public interest lawyer. He said, oh, well, I, I, I worked for Ralph Nader last summer. Let me, let me write him. And, and tell, I said, that's a ridiculous idea. He said, no, I'm going to do it. Of course, I couldn't stop him. Um, and I figured, well, all right. Sometime when Ralph would come to New York, he would, uh, I would meet with him, and he'd tell me how to get money because I had no idea how to raise money, and I didn't have any money of my own to start a public interest lawyer. So instead, what happened is a few weeks later, I got a call from Ralph's assistant, uh, the, the deputy in his office, who said to me, the public citizen is being formed. We want to start a litigation group. Ralph would like to talk to you about being in charge. So next thing I knew, had the interview, came down. Sure enough, uh, actually, it will be, uh, the, uh, anyway, I came down and I accepted the job. Uh, I took a pay cut from then, but I took a pay cut when I went to the U.S. Attorney's Office, too. too. That's my specialty. <laughs> uh, and uh, so that, that's what hap happened on, uh, on that. Um, and, and I came down and spent you know, close to 30 years or so there at, at Public Citizen. And it was a fabulous decision. I, lo I loved every, every, every one of them. During, the, during that time, I had a couple other serendipitous things. I, well, I was... I was asked to go back to teach to teach at Harvard, where I had gone to law school. A couple of my classmates were there, and they persuaded me to go and, and, and teach there. And so I, I did that, and I did that for a bunch of years. And that sort of got my foot in the door and being able to, to teach because I had had this. But while I was there, I had the, the, for just the first year I was there, I had two students, one of whom became the dean at NYU Law School, and the other one became the dean at Stanford, and they invited me. To, to go teach at, the, at those various places. And so that was entirely serendipitous. And I was on an ABA committee on, um, this one was, uh, this one was on uh, initiatives and referenda. And one of the lawyers on the committee, uh, a law professor on the committee, 
uh, called me one day and, and, and asked me in the middle of January, would like I could come to teach uh, at his law school. The law school happened to be the University of Hawaii Law School, and he was thinking about next January, and uh, that sounded like a pretty good idea to me. So that, that sort of fell in, in, into place. Anyway, those are the things that just have happened. And the last thing, my, my job here at, at GW, um, I was sitting in an office, I was uh, teaching for one year at, at American University Law School, and the phone rings and uh, the, the person on the other end says, hello, I'm Fred Lawrence, I'm the dean of GW Law School. And I told Fred this, so it's not a secret. I said I'd never heard of Fred before. I'd been, I'd been teaching at Stanford <laughs> for a few years before I came back here. And, and, and he said, uh, we've gotten a grant to set up a public interest uh, uh, dean, dean, dean and uh, I'd like to talk to you about it. And I said, sure. <laughs> so I came, to, I came down and met with him. Um, he subsequently told me that he didn't think that I would be willing to be considered for the job. But he thought I would t tell him uh, who, who, so other people who might be willing to be. No, no, I was interested and that was 13 years ago and I'm still here. Uh, uh, it, it reminds me that, that uh, of the story about Warren Buffett. Somebody asked Warren Buffett, how did you make all your money? What's the secret of your success in business? He said, I answer my telephone. <laughs> and so I answered my telephone that day, and sure enough, there was, there was Fred, and, and, and I've been here. So uh, I, I, I've been very, very lucky. Um, uh, there's a, 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 an adage by somebody named Branch Rickey, whom no, none of your generation will ever heard of, let alone he was the, the manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers uh, baseball team uh, in 1947 when he brought Jackie Robinson into the uh, Major League Baseball, broke the, the color barrier. Uh, and Ricky was often heard to say uh, that luck is the residue of skill. So you get lucky when you when you when you and and design and planning and being in the right place at the right time. And but but some of this was just blind luck, you know, all the, these these serendipitous things happening. And so, um, if nothing else, it, it should tell your listeners to to keep their eyes and ears open and and and. Uh, step forward and volunteer for things and, and, and look look for things that may not be there when you immediately look but they'll be there later on as you find them. Yeah and, and I'll note for people listening that when you look out the window of this office we are certainly not in Hawaii so <laughs> there must be something about DC and GW that's kept you here. Well yes I mean uh, uh, Hawaii is too far and even Stanford was too far. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're somebody who's been involved in all the things going on in Washington in the legal world, you want to be here. Uh, people know you, they call you, you have things to do, and, and uh, GW is a, a place where, where the students are engaged and in, in the real world, and uh, I, I try to find ways to, to encourage them to be more engaged. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, it's been fabulous speaking with you, um, and I think people are going to have a lot to gain from the advice you're giving. Last year, you had a fabulous sign-off from the end of our Zoom classes. I would love one more uh, think positive, test negative from you for our... Uh, oh, stay <laughs> positive and test negative? Yep. yep. <laughs> there it is. That's the motto of the day. It is. All right. Thank you so much. You're quite welcome. For everyone listening, if you enjoyed this episode of Nothing But Dicta, be sure to check out our website, nothingbutdicta.com, where you can listen to podcasts, read blog posts, and check out some helpful resources. A big thanks to Dean Allen Morrison, and thank you for listening.